Section 32, page 159. Arthur continued to stare through her as though she had been transparent. All he saw was the trumpery parasol that arced its pinkness above her giggling head. After a moment, he ventured, You don't happen to know why Madame Alaska went to Boston. I hope it wasn't on account of bad news. Miss Blanker took this with a cheerful incredulity. Oh, I don't believe so. She didn't tell us what was in the telegram. I think she didn't want to march in just enough. She's so romantic looking, isn't she? Doesn't she remind you of Mrs. Scott Siddons when she reads Lady Geraldine's courtship? Did you never hear her? Arker was dealing hurriedly with crowding thoughts. His wolf future seemed suddenly to be unrolled before him. And passing down its endless emptiness, he saw the dwindling future figure of a man to whom nothing was ever to happen. He glanced about him at the ampurant garden, the tumble-down house, and the oak grove under which the dusk was gathering. It had seemed so exactly the place in which he ought to have found Madame Olonska. She was far away, and even the pink sunshade wasn't hers. He frowned and hesitated. You don't know, I suppose. I shall be in Boston tomorrow if I could manage to see her. He felt that Miss Blanker was losing interest in him, though her smile persisted. Oh, of course, how lovely of you. She's staying at the Parker's house. It must be horrible during this winter weather. After that, Arker was but intermittently aware of the remarks they exchanged. He could only remember subtly resisting her entreaty that he should await the returning family and have high tea with them before he drove home. At length, with his hostess still at his side, he passed out of range of the wooden cupid, and fastened his horses and drove off. At the turn of the lane he saw Miss Blanker standing at the gate and waving the pink parasol. Chapter 23 The next morning, when Arker got out of the Fall River train, he emerged upon a steaming midsummer Boston. The streets near the station were full of the smell of beer and coffee, and decaying fruit and short-sleeved populace moved through them, with the intimate abandon of boarders going down the passage to the bathroom. Arker found a cab and drove to the Somerset Club for breakfast. Even the fashionable quarters had the air of untidy domesticity, to which no excess of heat ever degrades the European cities. Caretakers in calico lunged on the doorsteps of the wealthy, and the common looked like a pleasure ground on the morrow of a Masonic picnic. If Ocker had tried to imagine Ellen Olenska in improbable scenes, he couldn't have called up any into which it was more difficult to fit her than this heat prostrate and deserted Boston. He breakfasted with appetite and method, beginning with a slice of melon and studying a morning paper while he waited for his toast and scrambled eggs. A new sense of energy and activity had possessed him ever since he had announced to May that the night before that he had business in Boston, and shall take the Fall River boat that night, and go on to New York the following evening. It had always been understood that he would return to town early in the week, and when he got back from his expedition to Portsmouth a letter from the office, which fate had conspicuously placed on a corner of the hall table. Suffice it the just for his sudden change of plan. He was even ashamed of the ease with which the whole thing had been done. It reminded him, for an uncomfortable moment, of Lawrence Lefford's masterly contrivances for securing his freedom. But this didn't long trouble him, for he wasn't in an analytic mood. After breakfast, he smoked a cigarette and glanced over the commercial advertiser. While he was thus engaged, two or three men he knew in, and the usual greetings were exchanged. He was the same world after all, though he had such a queer sense of having slipped through the meshes of the time and space. He looked at his watch, and finding that it was half past nine, got up and went into the writing room. There he wrote a few lines and ordered a messenger to take a cup to the Parker house and wait for the answer. He then sat down behind another newspaper and tried to calculate 
how long it will take a cab to get to the Parker house. The lady was out, sir, he suddenly heard a waiter's voice at his elbow, and he stammered, out, as if it were a word in a strange language. He got up and went into the hall. It must be a mistake. She couldn't be out at that hour. He flushed with anger at his own stupidity. Why had he not sent the notes as soon as he arrived? He found his hat and stick and went forth into the street. The city had suddenly become as strange and vast and empty as if he were a traveler from distant lands. For a moment he stood on the doorstep, hesitating. Then he decided to go to the Parker house. But if the messenger had been misinformed and she were still there? He started to walk across the common and on the first bench, under a tree, he saw her sitting. She had a grey silk chance over her head. How could he ever imagine her with a pink one? As he approached, he was struck by her listless attitude. She sat there as if she had nothing else to do. He saw her drooping profile, and the knot of her hair fastened low in the neck under her dark hat, and the long wrinkled glow on the hand that held the sunshade. He came a step, step or two nearer, and she turned and looked at him. Oh, she said, and for the first time he noticed a startled look on her face. But in another moment it gave way to a slow smile of wonder and contentment. Oh, she murmured again, on a different tone. As he stood looking down at her, and without rising she made a place for him on the bench. I'm here on business, just got here, Arker explained, and without knowing why he had suddenly begun to feign astonishment at seeing her. But what on earth are you doing in this wilderness? He had really no idea what he was saying. He felt as if he were shooting at her across endless distances. Then she might vanish again before he could overtake her. I, oh, I am here on business too, she answered, turning her head toward him so that they were face to face. The words hardly reached him. He was aware only of her voice, and of the startling fact that not an echo of it had remained in his memory. He hadn't even remembered that it was low-pitched, with a faint roughness on the consonants. You do your hair differently, he said. His heart beating as if he had uttered something irrevocable. Differently? No, it's only that I do it as best I can when I'm with Nastasia. Nastasia? But isn't she with you? No, I'm alone. For two days, it wasn't worthwhile to bring her. You're alone at the Parker house? She looked at him with a flush of her old malice. Does it strike you as dangerous? No, not dangerous, but unconventional, I see. I suppose it is. She considered a moment. I hadn't thought of it, because I've just done something so much more unconventional. The faint tinge of irony lingered in her eyes. I just refused to take back a sum of money that belonged to me. Arker sprang up and moved a step or two away. She had furled her parasol and sat absently drawing patterns on the gravel. Presently he came back and stood before her. Someone has come here to meet you? Yes, with this offer. She nodded. And you refused because of the conditions? I refused, she said after a moment. He sat down by her again. What were the conditions? Oh, they weren't onerous. Just a step ahead of his table now and then. There was another interval of silence. Arker's heart had slumped itself, shut in the queer way it had, and he sat vainly groping for a word. He wants you back at any price? Well, a considerable price. At least the sum of his considerable for me. He paused again waiting about the question he felt he must put. It was to meet him here that you came. She stared, and then burst into a laugh. Meet him, my husband, here, at the season he is always at Covas or Baden. He sent someone? Yes. With a letter? She shook her head. No, just a message. He never writes. I don't think I have ever had more than one letter from him. The allusion brought the color to, the, to her cheek 
and it reflected itself in Arker's vivid blush. Why does he never write? Why should he? What does one have secretaries for? The young man's blush deepened. She had pronounced the word as if it had no more significance than any other in her vocabulary. For a moment, he was on the tip of his song to ask, Did he send his secretary then? But the remembrance of Count Alansky's only letter to his wife was the present to him. He paused again, and then took another plunge. And the person, the emissary? The emissary, Madame Alaska rejoined, still smiling, might, for all I care, have left already, but he had insisted on waiting till this evening, in case, on the chance, and you came out here to think the chance over. I came out to get a breath of air, the hotel's too stifling, I am taking the afternoon train back to Portsmouth. They sat silent, not looking at each other, but straight ahead at the people passing along the path. Finally, she turned her eyes again to his face and said, You are not changed. He felt like answering, I was, till I saw you again. But instead, he stood up abruptly and glanced about him at the young ante de sweltering park. This is horrible. Why shouldn't we go to let alone the bay? There is a breeze, and it will be cooler. We might take the steamboat down to Point Ardy. She glanced up at him hesitatingly, and he went on. On a Monday morning, there won't be anybody on the boat. My train doesn't leave till evening. I am going back to the New York. Why shouldn't we? He insisted, looking down at her, and suddenly he broke out. Haven't we done all we could? Oh, she murmured again. She stood up and reopened her sunshade, glancing about her as if to take counsel of the scene, and assured herself of the impossibility of remaining in it. Then her eyes returned to his face. You mustn't say things like that to me, she said. I will say anything you like, or nothing. I won't open my mouth unless you tell me to. What harm can it do to anybody? All I want is to listen to you, he stammered. She drew out a little gold-faced watch on an enameled chain. Oh, don't conclude, he broke out. Give me the day. I want to get you away from the man. At what time he was coming? Her color rose again. At eleven. Then you must come at once. You needn't be afraid if I don't come. Nor you either, if you do. I swear I only want to hear about you, to know what you have been doing. It's a hundred years since we have met. It may be another hundred years before we met again. She still wavered her anxious eyes on his face. Why didn't you come down to the beach to fetch me? The day I was at Granny's, she asked. Because you didn't look around. Because you didn't know I was there. I swore I wouldn't unless you looked around. He laughed as the childishness of the confession struck him. But I didn't look round on purpose. On purpose? I knew you were there. When you drove in, I recognized the ponies. So I went down to the beach. To get away from me as far as you could. She repeated in a low voice. To get away from you as far as I could. He laughed out again. This time in boy's satisfaction. Well, you see, it's no use. I may as well tell you, he added. That the business I came here for just to find you. But look here, we must start out, or we shall miss our boat. Our boat, she frowned perplexedly, and then smiled. Oh, but I must go back to the hotel first. I must leave a note. As many notes as you please, you can write here. He drew out a note case and one of the new stylographic pants. I've even got an envelope. You see how everything's predestined. There, study the thing on your knee, and I will get the pen going in a second. They have to be humored. Wait. He banged the hand that held the pen against the back of the bench. It's like jerking down the mercury in a thermometer. Just a trick. Now try. She laughed and bending over the sheet of paper, which she had laid on his note case, began to write. Arker walked away a few steps staring with radiant unseeing eyes at the passers-by, who, in their turn, 
Pause to stare at the unwanted side of a fashionably dressed lady writing a note on her knee on a bench in the camp. End of the section, page 164.